or okay. second uh, hour go. to get induction. Uh, wait. Yes, please, please wait. Uh, screen has to start. We have to go live. Okay, I believe that uh, we are live. So, uh, hello and welcome to the YR2020 session. Our today's theme is software development. My name is Krzysztof and I'm your host. With me, there are seven wonderful guests ready to share our knowledge with all of us. Please ask questions in the YouTube chat and follow up questions on our Slack channel so we could go back to them after the session. Our first guest is Mateusz Bonkawa, and the title of the presentation is Why you shouldn't concern yourself with copies in R with so often in parentheses. Mateusz, the floor is yours. Thanks. So here I am, and I think, yep, here we go. Welcome, ladies, gentlemen, and hedgehogs. My name is Mateusz Wonkawa, and, and the plan for today is to talk about the tricks our users to, to efficiently copy objects. Actually, don't expect to learn how to make your code quicker, but you can expect to learn what not to care about while trying to optimize your code so that you don't have to compromise the readability of your code. First, let's start with the nomenclature. I hope all of you already heard one of those words, name, symbol, variable. They are actually all the same in our context. How can we define them? Well, variable is a string of characters. It's used in math, physics, all the science, basically, and programming as well, of course. Programmers use variables to access the objects they created without having to know where they are placed in the memory, exactly. Actually, in our language, unlike in many other, variables are objects themselves. That means you can modify them and pass them to functions. And they are mostly supported in assignments, but if you work with non-standard evaluation, you probably know you can also quote them. Now, now that we know variables, that is symbol, we can talk about environments. They are like a map, that is, you have a key, you, that is a symbol or variable or whatever, and with this key, there is an associated value. And environments are basically a list of those symbol value pairs. And the one thing they also have is an attribute that is a pointer to an enclosing environment. So this is kind of a parent environment. It's, it's necessary to mark that environments can only have one parent and they almost always have exactly one parent. And the parents are assigned during the creation of the environment. So, and then they can be changed later. That means that environment form a hierarchical structure that is loopless. And that's very important for, you, for later. Now, how do they work? We know we can store objects in environment. And how do we access them? Well, imagine we have an environment and we have a symbol we look for. It, a simple recursion, actually. If we find a symbol in an environment, you just return the value. If not, I repeat the first feeder in the enclosing environment, and so on, and so on, until the base environment that holds all the operators and basic functions and constants. It's 
at the root of this hierarchy. Or actually an empty environment, but it's a minor detail. Are, there are two tricks are used to speed up the computation, to speed up this recursion. First, R has hashed environments so that we can access, find the symbol in nearly constant time. Also, the R has something called global cache that, that's a special environment that also have, as I guess, an empty end of a, an encoding environment that explain why empty environment actually exist. And this global page called all symbol value pairs you can access from global environment. That is the all the variables you created and all the packages you attach and the base environment as well, of course. Now to the point. How does copying work? What how would copying work if R wouldn't optimize it. Well, we get a, the basic mechanism is that we can uh, tell there are two basic scenarios. The first is when you assign an object to another object. When you copy a variable within an environment, that is, you've got an object we assign it to one object and then one variable and then another variable. We expect it to assign two copies of this object. The scenario number two is when you call a function and then you pass an object as an argument to this function. We, as running a function, create an evaluation environment, we would expect it would have to copy the object for the function to use. But it's not exactly that, luckily, because otherwise R would be uh, plainly unusable. Now, the scenario number one, actually, we don't copy the value upon the second and later assignment. Instead, objects have internally a field called reference count, some integer value initialized with value of one, of course. And this, this reference count is used to determine if copying is necessary. We basically can find two cases where reference count is equal to one and more than one. Of course, it can be equal to zero, but it's for garbage collector and not for us. Well, so when copying happens, when when an object has a reference count of at least two. And whenever you modify one of those variables that reference this object, that is, say, we assign new value to an element of a vector. Now, it's because all x, y, and z point to the same place in memory. But once we change our y, second element of y, then it can't change to this point in memory because we have to have some other object. And actually, we always change only one variable at the moment. I mean, internally at the very low level. We only, in the same time, we can only modify one variable. That means only this one variable is assigned a new value 
all the other are just left as they are and the reference count is decreased by one. Now, the second scenario. Coping or arguments would be terrific. It, I just can't imagine how would it even work. Let's just imagine. We get a function, it calls a function, which in turn calls another function. And all those functions are passed like 10 or 20 arguments all the way down and we also pass one big data frame like two gigabytes big and it would copy the hair of our memory sorry for the language but luckily there are promises in r and where can we stop them we can really construct them but they are here and they are here often. Well, we've got a function, an evaluation environment is created. This evaluation environment has, of course, an enclosing environment, and that's the environment of from where we call the function. And this evaluation environment has to have all the arguments we pass to the function and we have to hold also all the variables we create within the function. So about argument, we can do something like that and R does this. It populates the evaluation environment with pairs of symbols that are equal to all the arguments of the function and promises associated with those symbols instead of typical objects. Okay, a camera. Um, I it would be hard to do it at this point. Sorry. Mm, no well. problem. Please continue. Okay. Mm. Now, how do promise uh, are built? Well, the promises consist of three elements. The first is a pointer to enclosing environment. Mind you, it's the one we call the function from. Why do it have it? It, I will tell, tell you in a minute. The second element is an expression that describes the value. It can be a constant, like say five. It can be a variable like x, and it can be a complex expression like say x plus y plus z. Not really complex, but you get the idea. And the last part of a promise is value. It's initially empty, so promises are very light, and very small, take very little memory. And how do we use them? Well, whenever we want to access the value of a promise, we check if the value is empty. If not, we know what to do. If it is, then we evaluate the expression, we get the result and assign it to the value field, and then we can finally access it. Well, now we can combine two scenarios, the scenario number one and the scenario number two. And imagine we pass a, this big data frame, but we don't change it. We just pass it down the functions and we might access the, a few columns from this data frame. Now the promises and the scenario number one combined mean that unless we change something, the promises will be populated with values that point to the same place in the memory as the data, as the original data frame. That means passing the data frame won't, uh, won't take much memory unless we want to change something in it. That's, that's the genius part. 
I think. And the, how exactly are they evaluated those expressions within the context of the enclosing environment? Because only there we've got the um, we've got the how to say unchanged values of the variable. Well, those are some parts I don't want to go over. I even expected I won't have time for them. I just compiled them so that you can read them later, I think. Well. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Mateusz. Uh, uh, we are unfortunately running out of time. Uh, please okay. head to our uh, chat uh, for any questions, should they come up. Okay, Thank so you very I much can... for your wonderful presentation. Yeah, if you could yeah. uh, just wrap up uh, in one sentence. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to thank for the opportunity. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, our next guest is uh, Sever Ahmed Cizmeli. And the presentation topic is the journey of building a multi-tenant cloud platform running R. The floor is yours. Mm. We cannot hear you at the moment. although we can see your screen. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. I am unable to uh, maximize my window to, to open my, uh, my window became very small and I cannot open it to maximum. Uh, just a second. <laughs> like... Okay, so you can see my screen, I hope. Yes, we can uh, totally see your, your screen. Uh, but, um, okay. Uh, maybe if you cannot uh, at the moment uh, go full screen, uh, then uh, I can, maybe- I can go. Yes, you can go. Okay, so we can uh, start your presentation. Yes. Okay. You can see my screen? Yes. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Ahmed Chizmeli and I'm going to uh, tell our story about how we have constructed a data science platform. Uh, that is supposed to work uh, online on the web and then how the evolution uh, of that platform happened over the years and then uh, what is the next steps for moving forward. And um, uh, initially uh, the idea of uh, making a cloud platform was to be able to enjoy the uh, advantages of the uh, cloud, which is uh, uh, not having to install software, just upload your data and uh, just write some code or fork others' code, just like uh, we are able to do in GitHub, um, and be able to perform some kind of data analysis, machine learning, AI, or whatever you want to do in AR and share and publish results. Right now, all these things are, are possible with uh, desktop uh, software, uh, the traditional R binaries etc and different packages but all of them uh, need a different uh, software which have to be installed configured and then uh, maintained because they are all being uh, updated uh, without uh, uh, rest so uh, the cloud platform uh, as a software as a service uh, is an uh, is an answer to all these things, all these issues where just the logging in and starting to work uh, is the dream of a lot of people. And uh, we wanted to uh, be a player in that, uh, in, that, uh, in that challenge. So when we wanted to build our system, uh, we had initial uh, thoughts, initial requirements, what we wanted to do. We wanted to run, be able to run an R and Python code uh, 
obviously. And then we wanted to the platform to be web-based and multi-tenant in the in this context that uh, people can use the internet and the cloud facilities and web technologies to uh, communicate, to easily uh, share and collaborate. It has to be on cloud uh, so that uh, we can enjoy the scalability, uh, performance, scalability, and uh, just uh, renting a big machine uh, when we need, want it and pay only what we need, what we use. Those are uh, big advantages uh, of uh, cloud, especially today when GPUs are expensive hardware are being used. We also wanted to make a knowledge base uh, because uh, we th I, th I think and we think that uh, as a team, uh, uh, documentation about uh, science and data science and uh, R are very scattered and uh, we need a one uh, comprehensive area where we can easily search and uh, get trustable code trustable code, trustable use cases. So we also wanted to include a kind of a knowledge base system, uh, but that knowledge base is has to be executable. We're going to go on into that. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, architectural uh, drawing of the uh, requirements. And then uh, we have we moved on and we made some uh, design uh, decisions based on how to implement those things and initially it's uh, uh, there is something that our neither me nor my team has never uh, did before uh, as a little bit of a background i am an environmental uh, science background uh, i did research and teaching of the geospatial uh, data data analysis in um, in university level uh, so myself i'm not a professional programmer but uh, I like programming and uh, I understand how technologies talk to each other. So I had a set of ideas and when we started to build our team and uh, we, uh, made our, uh, uh, we made our professional team around the R&D company, R&D startup, uh, we started thinking about what we can uh, use to implement those requirements. And uh, we settled with uh, using uh, Node.js as a backend for the application uh, API. And then for the client, uh, we decided to use Vue.js, uh, which is a uh, three years ago when we started with it, uh, it was a quite upcoming, a new promising upcoming uh, toolkit, but nowadays it became a major player. Uh, so our decision about Vue.js has been uh, a good one. Um, in the database side, uh, we uh, decided to uh, to maintain users, uh, projects, uh, what belongs to whom, and uh, what are the different states of the work. Uh, we needed a database, and for this one, we uh, opted for uh, MongoDB, uh, possibly the obvious choice for a lot of people. After that, uh, we needed to provide also storage to our users so that they can upload their data and start to work on it. Uh, for this, uh, since we are using in Amazon, uh, we are using Amazon right now, uh, we are um, uh, using Amazon's uh, NFS version, which is a network file system uh, service, which is called AWS EFS service. Uh, we are using that so that for every user, uh, we are creating a mount point and then users can uh, upload their data into that space and then uh, that is mounted in the containers they are running and they can access those files and with a with the help of a file manager they can manage those files a little bit like uh, we can do it in Jupyter. So uh, we want it to be scalable you remember so when you want scalable things uh, the design is obviously a especially when you are multi-tenant uh, you want to build a cloud microservice where uh, a lot of the different uh, elements are independent services that may be written in different languages that may run on different servers and just communicating through uh, obvious uh, communication standards. So that's why we did, uh, for example, our authorization OAuth uh, server uh, is located into in another server. 
uh, our services, uh, Node.js uh, running the backend is an, in yet another server, etc. To be able to manage the cloud uh, scalability, we obviously decided to run things inside the Docker, uh, especially to be able to help uh, in scaling up. And to orchestrate that, uh, we had to decide between uh, ECS, Amazon ECS, which is a managed uh, uh, scalable cloud uh, container running system, or the famous Kubernetes. Um, since we didn't have a lot of resources on, on board and uh, Kubernetes initial learning uh, curve was uh, a little too steep for us, we opted for Amazon ECS and we decided to run that one. And uh, uh, to be able to communicate with instances of R and Python, uh, we needed a backend. And for this backend, we are using the Jupyter API. Uh, the rest of the, uh, all the components are written by ourselves totally. Uh, we're not using Jupyter in anything, in any GUI, graphic, or file system, or, or project uh, format. Uh, we are using just the Jupyter API for uh, communicating with the running instances. This took, at, uh, this took us uh, about uh, two, two and a half years to uh, really get it work. And then, of course, uh, along the time, uh, as we go along, just like with any R&D project, uh, we have seen that uh, there could be some stuff that could be, uh, um, that could be uh, improved. So did we. Uh, I would also like to, before that, uh, lay out the architecture for the knowledge base that we have. Uh, the knowledge base is the uh, is a service that we are uh, downloading all the uh, available CRAN packages uh, into our uh, server, and then uh, we are uh, opening them one by one and uh, include uh, parsing the contents of the dependencies and the documentation text, and then putting them in a graph database which is Neo4j, and this graph database allows us to make an analysis of uh, what package depend on what uh, other packages and what function is uh, used by a project uh, which depends other projects and other packages, etc. So we are uh, able to lay out the whole uh, dependency graph of the database uh, layout, and uh, uh, we are able to uh, answer questions like uh, who is at the same time using the function, the same function I am currently working on. Can I inter interact with that person or can I ask the questions uh, to that person or what other projects uh, are actually using the package that I am currently using or trying to learn to be able to make these things uh, much more uh, uh, cloud ready, uh, we are using Neo4j uh, as a graph dependency. So we needed to update the system after a while, just like uh, with any serious, uh, uh, serious uh, software which evolves. And uh, we have made some updates into the system. And this uh, updates mostly uh, are very technical and I'm not gonna go into much details about it, but most of it, uh, in the previous system, if you remember, we are using uh, one instance of Jupyter, which is which was uh, communicating with uh, different uh, containers, uh, language containers that are uh, being used. Uh, so they were all separate. Uh, Jupyter was separate than the language containers. Uh, we saw that it was a very, not quite effective approach. So the way with it is that uh, in one container, now we are shipping both Jupyter and Python and R. They are working all in the same uh, uh, container and then they are able to even run together. Uh, nowadays, we are able to make R and Python talk to each other. So uh, this also allows us to uh, offer that uh, uh, option. We can open a open a variable and then uh, create it in R and read it in Python and vice versa. So along those uh, different um, uh, different challenges, uh, one was the SSR, uh, server-side rendering, because we client, web, client, web infrastructures like uh, Vue 
uh, are compiled on the browser, so it doesn't give uh, Google or other search engines any content to uh, browse, uh, browse uh, to index. Uh, that's why uh, we decided to implement a server-side rendering uh, technology so that uh, the server renders first the content and then this content is available to the public and then uh, research engines can index it so that it's it's possible to uh, uh, it's possible to collaborate and be seen on the internet. This is where we came so far, and our next steps. What are our next steps? Is that uh, we have done a lot of educational activities uh, in uh, in um, in the uh, uh, for preceding years, and then we have seen that uh, when we use our data science notebook interface with the webinar tools, just like we are using now with Zoom or with other ones, uh, teaching can become very good, very uh, efficient because people can run at the same time while learning, they can run and uh, get feedback from the teacher. However, uh, the, these two combinations are not really equivalent to a desired classroom. Uh, because um, in the COVID times, uh, uh, virtual classrooms are starting to become a real uh, need. However, uh, the uh, telecommunication software like a webinar software, Zoom, etc., are not designed for classroom activities. And it's very difficult to assess the uh, quality of the learning, especially uh, how students learn. Are they learning? Are they engaging? And then uh, what can we do to uh, keep them active, uh, uh, keep their attention active? Uh, because the students also from their side, uh, they have been uh, sitting in front of a computer the whole day now. And even if COVID-19 situation uh, is healed and goes away, uh, we will see that in the future, uh, cloud-based learning uh, will have much bigger uh, perspective than before. So, uh, yes. uh, excuse me, uh, we are unfortunately running out of time. So could you wrap up uh, your presentation with uh, one last sentence, please? Okay, uh, so uh, our, our, our tool is becoming an e-learning platform where uh, we can teach uh, technical stuff with, uh, with um, uh, over a web interface and then use some machine learning and AI for uh, increasing education uh, uh, efficiency. So uh, we would like to contribute with uh, different uh, uh, R&D minded uh, people and uh, researchers around that. So if you are interested, please uh, get in touch with me so that we can create a very uh, nice interface together. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. Please head to the chat and see if there are uh, any uh, question uh, popping up. All right. And okay. uh, our next uh, guest is Dominik Rafac with presentation titled Seven Pillars of Tibbles, Effective Construction of Customized Tibbles with the Pillar Package. The floor is yours. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you can all see my presentation. Uh, okay, so uh, my name is Dominik Grafacz. I'm a student at Warsaw University of Technology. I'm studying data science. And also I'm an active R package developer. Um, this title is, as some of you probably have noticed, is a reference to a book called Seven Pillars of Wisdom. Uh, but the title is the only reference. Uh, well, maybe also spoiler alert. Uh, in my opinion, using table is a very wise uh, movement. So, um, but that's all. Uh, during this presentation, uh, I will show you uh, what is a table, why using table over data frame is uh, better. Uh, and how you can easily uh, extend this package. Uh, so what is Tibble? Uh, according to the official uh, website, Tibbles are a modern take on data frames. They keep all features that have stood the test of time and drop all features that used to be convenient but are now frustrating. Uh, Tibbles are just a substitution for a uh, data frame and they are uh, important building block of the tidyverse. 
uh, among all the tidyverse packages, uh, most of them, instead of using data frames, use tables. For example, if you uh, if it happens for you to use a dplyr package, uh, applying operations using dplyr returns not pure data frame but a table. And uh, but why uh, why uh, Tay invented it, and uh, what what are those uh, features that uh, have stood the test of time, and we, which is inconvenient? Which one are inconvenient? Well. Let's list them. Unfortunately, uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, really? Wait. Uh, OK, now it's better. Yeah, you can hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Please OK, continue. sorry, I have no idea what happened. Uh, OK, so uh, I want to tell you about uh, um, advantages of using tables over data frames. Uh, Firstly, they provide input data safety, uh, input non-standard evaluation, name safety, subsetting consistency, they reduce recycling, and uh, they have way better aesthetics. Uh, let's dig into these uh, points in detail. Uh, firstly, no changing types. Uh, I bet uh, a lot of you have uh, Ha had problems with uh, supplying a data frame with a character vector. Uh, and then you had problems because they were converted into factors. Uh, this, is, this was the default behavior uh, in uh, R uh, up to the version uh, 4.0. Now it's also not, uh, there is no default conversion to the factor, uh, but tables, uh, Tables had this uh, tables by default do not change the input type. Uh, what you provide is what is kept inside. And uh, this is really convenient in my opinion, uh, because I do not have to guess what happens inside. Uh, another uh, advantage of using table is that uh, you can provide it with some, um, you can name a variable inside the table and then use this name uh, when creating other columns. If you were using a data frame instead here, you would have to create this vector x outside the constructor of uh, data frame. And uh, this will make code less clean, I would say. Mm, this saves us a bit of, uh, a bit of code and each line uh, is very important, I think. Uh, another thing is that tables do not change variables' names. Uh, R, have, uh, R has something like uh, valid uh, names. Uh, well, there are some restrictions on which names are valid. For example, they do not, uh, uh, they shouldn't begin with a number, there shouldn't be spaces or special characters inside. Uh, but, but sometimes you just receive a data frame, you read a data frame from a file, and you cannot control which name or what names are inside. And in this situation, data frame uh, transforms the name into a monster like this, uh, while, data uh, while table uh, provides us uh, with this feature that it do not change any name, it's just lazier. Uh, the next one uh, feature, the next feature which I really, really admire uh, is the fact that subsetting a table with some values will always result in a table, uh, which is not a thing using data frame because when you subset a data frame with single value, uh, you receive a vector. Uh, when you subset a data frame with a data frame or with a, a pair of values or with a vector of values, you will get a data frame. If you, uh, well, you can also uh, subset, subset it with a null values and so on. Well, table always returns a table. This is very important for me as for the developer because sometimes I do not know in advance uh, what values uh, are used in my code. And I do not have to make if else a statement uh, to keep track of the types of data. And uh, another thing is 
reduced recycling. Uh, I really like that R is vectorized and I really like that almost every base function tries to be vectorized and to make sure that uh, your input, uh, all your input vectors have the same length. If it's not like this, it uh, recycles uh, the shorter vectors or the longer vectors. If uh, it was a data frame, we would have a data frame of length 30 because that's time 10 times three, yeah? Uh, well, Tibble is lazier. Uh, it just returns an error because uh, sometimes situations like this are just a mistake and Tibble uh, prefers us to explicitly uh, make our vectors uh, to have the same length. Uh, you can only um, provide a vector of length one to be recycled. And uh, that's a quite common thing. And last but not least, um, aesthetics. Well, uh, if you try to print data frame um, and you have a big data frame, it will probably overflow your console. Uh, it has a very uh, big uh, value for uh, default max uh, lines of printing. And it also tries to print every column. So if not every column fits into the console, it will be printed afterwards, um, which looks really terrible in my opinion. You also cannot guess uh, which column is character vector? Well, you can guess, but uh, not you cannot be sure because these numbers can be in fact a character vector or a factor. Uh, well, uh, and here is the uh, here is how table looks like. Uh, table always prints only first ten rows of the of the object. It also informs you. Uh, what type of the data is the uh, is the column, and uh, only columns that fit into the console are printed. Uh, the, the, the rest of the uh, columns are just printed. Uh, their, their names are printed after the data. Um, it has also if you if your console supports uh, color. Uh, it also has uh, a different color for NA values or for negative values. Mm, it can underscore uh, mm, values by uh, decimal separators. Well, table is just way prettier. Okay, so mm, let's suppose we fall in love with uh, tables and we, uh, we are creating some Mm, let's suppose we are developing a package for analysis of biological sequences. Let's call this package uh, tidysq. And suppose we have our custom type of data. Uh, let's call this type of data sq. Uh, and this type of data internally is kept as list of row vectors, not as a character vector, uh, which is mostly the case. Uh, let's say that's because of reasons. Uh, and we really like to fit into the tidyverse. We want to be as tidy as possible. We want to be efficient and so on and so on. Uh, so uh, it's quite obvious that we should use table instead of data frames. Uh, so let's put our object, our SQ object into the, into the table. Uh, well, it looks like this. SQ, as I've told, is list of row vectors. It will be printed in this way. But we're quite not happy uh, with it because uh, these uh, sequences are encoded in some way and we cannot just uh, see what, uh, what are, is, how this sequence is in fact look like. They are, for example, uh, DNA sequences and this, do, do not, the, this does not look like DNA. It's time to use uh, the pillar package. Uh, pillar package, uh, is, uh, uh, is what uh, Tibble is using to print uh, its, in its fancy way. These are in fact uh, pillars and a pillar is really easily extendable. We just need to uh, create three methods uh, for three generic functions uh, to print our objects better. Uh, the first uh, function is a pillar shaft SQ. 
uh, where of course SQ is the name of the class we want to print. And this function transforms our object into character vectors in some way. We, uh, we will skip uh, the details. Uh, and after that, this object, this transform object is provided to the new pillar shaft function. Uh, we've specified the return type of the object. Uh, okay, we transformed our object into characters. Now we need to specify how to format these characters. And this is where format uh, me uh, method comes in. Uh, we need to create this format method. Uh, again, let's skip the details. Uh, we are doing some fancy uh, formatting things. And in the end, uh, one minor detail uh, is the type summary uh, function, uh, type sum for shortage. Uh, this function informs us uh, how we want to have our type of data name displayed in the table. Uh, here we have cDNA, which stands for cleaned uh, DNA sequence. Uh, okay, uh, let's suppose we implemented those functions and uh, voila, this is how it looks like. Uh, it looks way better in my opinion. Uh, we have uh, green colored letters. Uh, green is the color of the hope. So uh, I hope you like it and um, the users will like it. And uh, we have also, we can also keep additional information because it's uh, up to us what we are doing in those implemented functions. And we can inform, for example, how long are those sequences uh, in case they do not fit into the console. Uh, we can also use the vectors package uh, in this situation because vectors package is uh, one step uh, further in uh, making uh, our data fit into the tidyverse. Uh, but that's topic for another presentation. Uh, I would say that you can, as you probably have guessed, tidysq is a real package. Uh, which I'm currently working on, uh, along with uh, the speaker, uh, with the um, with the Mateusz Bunkawa, who was uh, presenting uh, 15 minutes ago, and we in fact implemented vectors package. So uh, uh, yeah, I really uh, I really like it, and I really uh, hope uh, you will try using it on your own. Uh, so to sum up. Tibble is safer and more convenient than data frame. Tibble is fancier and uh, looks better. And also Tibble is really easily extendable. We can find tutorials online. Mm. Let's use Tibble instead of data frame. Uh, in the end, I would like to uh, say thank you to uh, my whole team, Biogenius Group. Uh, especially to Michał Burdukiewicz, uh, Mateusz Bonkawa, and Jadwiga Słobik, who are uh, co-developing uh, TidySQ with me. And yeah, thanks for uh, your attention. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting presentation. Uh, please uh, head to the uh, chat and see if uh, any questions will uh, pop up. And uh, now we can... Uh, uh, start uh, next presentation. Uh, please welcome. Uh, oh yes, uh, just a second. Excuse me. Uh, please welcome uh, Andrew Collier and uh, Matt Dennis with uh, the um, presentation on using Trundler to construct the ZAF alcohol index. The floor is yours. It would help if I unmuted and started my video. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Matt. Um, and on behalf of my colleague, Andrew and I, thank you very much for joining us today. Andrew and I are from South Africa, and we work together on a project called Trundler. And Trundler is a service that provides historical retail pricing data through an API. So today we'd like to tell you how we used Trundler to construct the South African alcohol index. And specifically, we'd like to tell you how we use the Trundler R package to do that. 
So the first question that you might ask is, why build an alcohol index? And that's a great question. Alcohol is a bit of a touchy subject in South Africa at the moment, because when COVID-19 reached South Africa, the government imposed a number of severe restrictions. And one of these restrictions was a ban on the sale of alcohol for about three and a half months. So here you can see a timeline of the alcohol bans during South Africa's lockdown. And in fact, you can see there were, there were two bans. The first ban started on the 27th of March and it lasted 66 days. And then the ban was lifted, but unfortunately there was a spike in the number of alcohol related hospital admissions. So the government put in place another ban which started on the 13th of July and that ban lasted 36 days. So in total, that was a ban of 102 days on the sale of alcohol. And for the average South African, 102 days was a very long time indeed to go without their favorite alcoholic drink. So in desperation, some South Africans turned to brewing their own pineapple beer. And unfortunately, in several cases, this had lethal consequences. But eventually, the alcohol ban was lifted and South Africans were able to go to their nearest alcohol retailer and select their favorite alcoholic drink. And the queues outside the alcohol, alcohol stores were really, really long. And so we wondered if the retailers would hike their prices in anticipation of this enormous demand for alcohol. And, and ultimately that's what led us to build the DOP index, um, which is the name that we gave for the South African alcohol index. And we called it the DOP index because the word DOP means an alcoholic drink in South African slang. Thanks, Matt. To um, build the DOP index, we needed to get historical price data for as many alcohol products as we could find. And we certainly weren't planning to hire an army of price collectors to go from store to store. And uh, the retailers themselves definitely weren't going to be parting with their precious price data. It's presuming that they even had a record of it. So how could we gather the data that we needed well, of course, we got to use Trundler to do that. Now, Trundler consists of a, a horde of, of crawlers, each targeting a specific retailer. Now, the data from those crawlers is pushed into a queue uh, where some simple quality control is applied, and then the data is ultimately persisted into a database. Now, the fundamental mechanism for accessing the Trundler data is via an API. But an API is, uh, well, it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea or their glass of wine for that matter. So in the tradition of many other great R packages, we built a wrapper around the API. And uh, using the package, it's possible to get the Trundler data in a nice tidy format with just a few lines of R code. So let's take a look at how that's done. The first thing you need to do is install Trundler either from CRAN or GitHub and load up the library. And then you need to specify an API key, which you can get either directly from us or via Rapid API. And once you've done that, you can start to explore the catalog of retailers using the retailer function. Each retailer is specified by name, URL, and currency. Now, for this particular application, the South African Alcohol Index, we were only interested in South African retailers. So we used the country field to filter out retailers from other countries. Next, you'll want to see a list of products. Uh, the products function will access products across the full range of retailers. Um, we'll see in a moment how that listing can be filtered down However, in principle, this is a very long list indeed. The retailer's product, the retailer products function allows you to focus only on the products for a specific retailer. And the resulting table includes the product name, the brand, the model, if that information is available, as well as the SKU, 
which is a, a unique identifier. Well, it's unique per retailer. There's also actually barcode data available as well, provided that the retailer is sharing that on their site. Now, if you don't want to get an exhaustive list of products, then you can also filter them by name and or brand. And here we've searched for Amarula Cream, which is a popular brand of South African liqueur. And you can see by looking at the retailer ID column that Amarula is available from a variety of different retailers. Once you've identified a particular product that you're interested in, you can use the product ID to access its price history with the product prices function. And the results include the time, the price, the promotion price, if the product is on promotion, as well as an effective price. And this indicates what a customer would pay if they purchased the product at a particular time. Now, the data you can see here shows that Amarula has been listed at a variety of prices and that it has also been on promotion. Now, understanding a price history like that is a lot easier with a plot. And here we can see the regular price in blue as well as the promotion price in orange. Evidently, the price of Amarula is fairly volatile. At the beginning of the year, a bottle was selling for 135 Rand. However, in March, actually before lockdown, it shot up to 160. And since then, it has also been on offer at 150 and briefly on promotion at 140. Now, one of the biggest challenges with Trundler has been linking similar products or identical products across different retailers. And to this end, we've been building a product taxonomy. Products are assigned to a category in a hierarchy. And at present, we're using a rules-based approach to make that assignment. However, we're also developing a more intelligent system that is a data-driven classifier. So, Focusing our attention on a specific portion of the product taxonomy, alcoholic beverages, we pulled out all products falling into the four highlighted categories, spirits, beer, red wine, and white wine. And for each of these categories, we used the taxonomy to identify all products available at a range of South African retailers. And then we found the associated price histories. So the next thing we needed to do was to pull all of those data together to construct an index. This table shows the number of products considered broken down by category and retailer. Already, these data provide a statistically representative sample, but we're adding in new products all the time, and we're striving to really get an all-encompassing view of all alcoholic products on sale in South Africa. We normalized each of the price time series to a date just before lockdown and then averaged them to form a price index for each of the categories. And this is what those indices look like. It's apparent that there has been substantial variation across all of the categories. Of course, Ultimately, we want to distill these four indices down to a single number, which is the DORP index. And an important component of constructing such an index is working out how to weight the various components. For the DORP index, we needed to know what proportion of the drinking population consumed from each of those categories. Now, fortunately for us, a 2018 report from the World Health Organization provided precisely that information, showing that almost 60% of the alcohol consumed in South Africa is beer, and wine and spirits account for around 20% each. So using those weights, we then consolidate the individual indices into a single index. The reference date for the index is the 21st of March, a week before lockdown came into effect on the 27th of March. And after remaining more or less constant for the first few weeks of lockdown, 
the price of alcohol started to increase rapidly around the 4th of May when we went from level five to level four. Prices peaked on the 1st of June when we went to level three and alcohol went back on sale. So since then, the index has remained more or less stable. Overall, the average price of alcohol has increased by just over 3% since before lockdown. Now, in an absolute sense, that's not a massive increase. However, relative to the nominal inflation rate, it's huge. So that's the DORP index in a nutshell. And it was a super fun project to pull together. Now the alcohol bans in South Africa had an interesting side effect. Remember what we said earlier about South Africans turning to brewing their own pineapple beer once they had run out of alcohol? Well, it turns out that the year 2020 has experienced the highest demand for pi pineapples ever. And if we look at this uh, plot over here, you can see that the price of pineapples actually increased during the alcohol sales bans and decreased um, when the bans were lifted. Who would have thought that the coronavirus would have led to the death of so many pineapples? Now, Trandler has data on a wide range of products, and we're interested in putting these data in the hands of anyone who's interested in them. And in fact, we think it's really important that consumers have access to these sorts of data. And we've started to see how retailers are manipulating customers on the shop floor with their pricing strategies. So take, for example, this packet of white sugar, which is sold at one of South Africa's major retailers. The blue line represents the regular price of this product, and the orange line represents its promotional price. And as you can see, this product has been on promotion rather a lot. And in fact, it turns out that in the last seven months, this product was only not on promotion on four occasions. Now, as a consumer, if you knew that, would it change your behavior? It certainly would change my behavior. For starters, I'd be really annoyed if I ever paid the full price for this product. And I probably also wouldn't stock up on this product when it's marked as being on promotion because I'd know that there'd be a pretty good chance that the product would still be on promotion when I return to the store the following week. So those are the sorts of insights that Trundler can provide. But of course, on a broader scale, Trundler can be used to calculate and analyze price inflation. And that's what we did with the DORP index. But right now, we're also building a food price index. And it's still in the early stages. But already we've seen that inflation on basic food items in South Africa has been higher than the reported annual inflation rate. And that's rather concerning in a country like South Africa, where so many people live on or below the poverty line. So we hope that by making this sort of information available to the public, that we'll be able to empower consumers on the shop floor to make prudent financial decisions, and also that we'll be able to assist regulatory authorities in monitoring food price inflation. Trundler has a number of international retailers in its catalog, and here you can see 10 of them. And the good news is we're adding new retailers to the catalog every week. So if there are any retailers that you're interested in, please get in touch with us because we'd love to add them to the Trundler catalog. For now though, that's all from us. Thank you very much for watching our presentation this afternoon. We hope that you found it interesting and we hope that you'll find using the Trundler package very useful. And if there are any retailers that you're interested in, um, please do let us know. We'd be happy to add them to, to the Trundler database. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for your interesting and wonderful presentation. Uh, please head to the chat and see if uh, uh, any questions pop up. And uh, our next guest is uh, John Cohen, and uh, he'll be presenting a robust JavaScript with R. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'll share my screen and trust that you can hear me. 
I hope you can see that, start more video, we should be good. Thank you very much. Um, so what do we have? Yes, Rob is JavaScript for R. So uh, I've done a lot of work with JavaScript in the past. And so came this, this, this project called that I named Packer um, in, in an attempt to make things uh, hopefully a bit more robust when you bring JavaScript into your R workflow. So what is it exactly? Well, it brings Webpack and NPM to R. Um, Webpack is a JavaScript library that allows you to bundle, transform, minify your code and do plenty of a lot of other things that uh, we'll delve in shortly. Um, and NPM is Node Package Manager. Now it's loosely, um, loosely equivalent to R's CRAN essentially. Um, so the question remains, why bring those things into your workflow anyways? Uh, well, one thing is code management. Uh, just like in R, as you know, a small script for a small project works just fine, but many scripts for a large project, it's absolute hell. Um, there's also the problem of code structure, where in R, when you create a large project, I believe at least you should build a package, use Drake, targets, or anything else, but at least structure the code sensibly. Um, and the same concerns apply to JavaScript or any other programming language for that matter. Um, but the problem with code structure in JavaScript is that unlike our packages, there are, there's no strict um, structure that is enforced. Um, there's no strict CRAN that can reject your package. NPM, which is Node Package Manager, where you push your package will accept pretty much anything. There's no check whatsoever. There's no equivalent to RCMD check to raise warnings, notes, or errors on your code. Um, so it can get very messy with JavaScript. Um, code management with JavaScript is, I believe, at least exacerbated by the fact that you're playing with different kinds of files and JavaScript doesn't run on its own. Um, you, you rarely have a JavaScript um, file that'll just work on its own unless you're in Node. Um, so you probably have one HTML file or in R in this context, you would have one shiny UI um, or one R markdown document, but you might have multiple JavaScript files and then they use styles that are in CSS or images that are somewhere else. And that quickly becomes difficult to manage. Another thing with JavaScript is browser support. Now in R, we don't have that problem, thankfully. So the code you write on R four point something will likely run on R three point whatever, um, but with JavaScript, not so much. So the JavaScript code you write will not necessarily run on every browser. Um, as new releases of JavaScript come out, browsers have to catch up. Um, and therefore the latest features are really available uh, on, on, on the browsers, on every browser. Um, so in front there is a is a is a table from canIuseit.com I think, um, and shows which browser and their versions actually can run ES6, which is a version of JavaScript released in 2016. Yet as you can see, many of them still can't run it. Um, so in more concrete examples. For example, JavaScript, uh, if I have two files, I have a JavaScript function file that has just simple function and a main file that uses that function. When I import that in a shiny UI or elsewhere, I have to make sure that I import them in the correct order. Uh, I have to import functions first and then the main file, otherwise it won't work. Um, when you work with JavaScript, code size matters. Everything has to be loaded in the browser and therefore the smaller the file, the faster it loads um, the better it is overall. Um, however, you can write the code that's here on the left, probably. You can write and read it, but you can't write or read minified code. So you need to handle that again. Um, again, with the browser support, here are ES8, one of the latest versions that won't work in probably most browsers just yet. Um, just a few functions that you can run. You can do that uh, in some other ways, of course. It doesn't mean you can't do any of these, but you can't use those very functions. Um, so in a sense, they, there's too much cognitive load when you write JavaScript code. Uh, and you end up not being able to focus on the code that you write. And 
um, you have to think of all these things of whether it can run on a, on a, on a whether it can be minified, how, whether it can run on, on the browsers, etc. cetera. Um, so meet Webpack. Webpack handles a lot of that for you, thankfully. So what it does, or some of what it does at least, it bundles the code. So your multiple files are bring into a single file that you can easily source into your HTML. It transforms the code so you can use Babel loaders and other things. So you can write the latest JavaScript and Webpack will transform it and, make, and ensure it can run on pretty much any browsers. It will minify it for you. So from the nice readable code that you can write to a minified file that'll load faster, it'll manage the dependencies for you so that you can um, uh, so, so that you can have multiple files and they're yeah, managed correctly. It's difficult to explain. Um, it does this fancy thing it calls tree shaking, which is essentially just removing dead code. If you have dead variables, functions that are not used, when Webpack bundles that, it won't include those if they're not used. And it does plenty more. So very easy. What you do is you start by creating your package, move into that package, Webpack runs on NPM, so you need to initialize NPM. You need to install Webpack, of course, create a directory where the source code will be, modify the package.json so that you can use Webpack, add the various config files that you'll use um, to run Webpack, and then add all these files to your build ignore and git ignore. So, and then you need to apply that every time you do a project um, and do it and handle multiple cases for that involved JavaScript with R. So inputs, outputs, HTML widgets, a golem app, whatever. So in hindsight, it helps, but only so much because there's a lot to do every time. So here comes Packer. The idea of Packer is that it handles that, a lot of that for you. Um, so first, the, the idea, one of the ideas of Webpack is that it structures your code, your JavaScript code. So in order to, to marry that well with um, R, everything takes place in uh, a package. Um, a package includes, of course, Golem applications. Um, Packer never becomes a dependency to what you're creating. It's really, it really aspires to be more of a use this to automate those tasks that were on a previous slide that um, that involve JavaScript. So using Packer, in a sense, is very easy. Um, it involves simply creating a package, of course, or a Golem app, um, use a scaffold, and then bundle your code. Um, so for the scaffolds, what are these? Um, just as a quick note, I totally stole that term and that idea from the HTML widgets package. If you've not built any, you might not be familiar with it, but it comes with this function called scaffold widget. And I thought it'd be great to be able to bring that to Packer to use Webpack, NPM, and be able to scaffold different kinds of things. So what can you scaffold? Well, if you have a Golem app, you can simply scaffold for the Golem app. If you want to create HTML widgets, you can build different scaffolds for your HTML widgets. Same for extensions, which you might know as, um, as uh, handlers in, in, in Shiny. Uh, custom outputs, custom inputs, etc. You're not limited to one scaffold per project. You can, um, you can have multiple ones. And bundle, what is it? Well, this is the simple action of that Webpack does, but it takes your JavaScript code, bundles it into a single file or multiple files if you want to. <clears throat> so a few examples, here's a widget example. So you create a package and then you just scaffold the, the widget. It also takes a name so that you can have multiple ones. You install the dependencies, you bundle, and here on the right, you then have your, your working um, HTML widget. Uh, an input, for instance, you create a package again, you scaffold an input, you give it a name because you can have, again, different kind of inputs um, in a single project, in a single package. Then you bundle the code, of course, and you're ready to use it. So how does it work? Just a quick example. So you create a package. Here, use, use this. If you want to use RStudio ID, whatever, it, it'll work too. Uh, and then you scaffold. Here in this example, I have what I call an extension. We'll see what it is. It's a, essentially the bi-directional communication between the front end and the server in Shiny. 
Um, so you run the scaffold and you can see on the messages here uh, that printed in console that it does quite a bit for you. So it creates the uh, SRC JS folder, which will hold all your source code for JavaScript. Um, it installs the dependencies, Webpack, it creates the config files, it adds, it changes the package.json scripts, it adds everything you need to the git ignore or our build ignore, um, modifies the description of your package. Now it uses shiny, adds shiny there, um, and there's a few more things. And essentially from the directed tree that you see on the right here, at least everything will work fine for your R package. You can um, document, load, check that package, it will work despite all these files being there. Uh, what else they did? It created our, our files, of course. Um, one file here to, to serve those um, assets that will be used, of course, with uh, the JavaScript code that you run. Uh, a function to import those um, um, function to, to import those dependencies that you're going to create in your Shiny application. Here, I'll just go back one. We named the uh, extension ask, so it created use ask. Um, this is similar to, you might have used shiny.js. They have a function called use shiny.js. Um, and then it created the ask r, which is the ask.r file, which is the file that contains the function that will let us uh, move this prompt or this alert. Uh, and again, it fills in the, the, the documentation for you. Uh, and brings an example. And then what else it created for JavaScript? Well, in this case, it's very simple. It's just a, a message handler uh, that's placed in this directory. And essentially what now you need to do is to bundle that code where it goes get that file and moves it to your inst uh, for installation files of your package um, so they can be used. Uh, and then we take the example that was generated automatically and out of the box, this is the example you get. Uh, so I think it's pretty neat that you don't have to manage all of this and you run two or three functions and you're ready to go and create your custom extension here. The same works for inputs, outputs, whatever you have in mind, you just have a few functions and it handles everything for you. Then if you wanna go further, and I have a lot of examples of that on the website of the, the project, uh, there's different loaders, so you can load Babel, add, add your loaders for Babel so that you can use the latest versions of uh, JavaScript. You can uh, add special loaders for styles, which is absolutely amazing. We can, you don't really need CSS anymore. Everything is in your JavaScript file. Um, you can bring Vue or React, again, examples on the website, which is pretty cool. It can bring, um, make a Vue, use Vue easily, use Vue in a Shiny application. Uh, change the templating engine if you want. Use Pug for your UI in Shiny, for instance. Uh, and this is about it. This is all I have. Uh, I think I might have one minute or, or, or two left. I was going to show you my cat for internet points, but it ran away. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, please, uh, as well, uh, head to the chat and see if uh, any questions pop up. Cheers. And uh, our uh, uh, final guest is uh, Shelmit Kariuki uh, with uh, the presentation Building the First Kenyan Census Data Package. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Please confirm when you see my slides. Just a minute. Yes, we can see them. Um, can you see them on full screen? Yes, we can see them on full screen. Okay, thank you so much. So again, my name is Shalmith. I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm here to talk about a small pet project I embarked on at the beginning of the year, which is the our Kenya census package. So this is a package that contains the results of the 2019 Kenya population and housing sensors. Um, you can download it. You can install it in R through that link. It's not yet on CRAN, so I've still hosted it on my GitHub profile. The exercise took place in August 2019, and the results were released in February. 
um, this year, just one month before the first COVID case was confirmed in Kenya, the results were produced by the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, which is a department in the Ministry of Planning that collects and disseminates data on behalf of the government. Um, the data was published in four PDF files with very interesting um, data sets in each of them. And just to give you a small geographical um, background about the boundaries in Kenya. Kenya is divided into 47 counties and within these counties we have different sub-counties um, and the data was reported according to counties and some other data sets all have both counties and sub-counties. I come from a county called Nyeri, that's where my folks are um, live rather, uh, but I work, I live and work in um, Nairobi which is also the capital city of Kenya. And the reason I'm talking about boundaries is when you look at the data, the data that was published, it was published as again per county or sub-county. And this is how the data looked like <clears throat> when you view, when you look at, uh, when you look at it on the PDF files, very neat, very nice. Um, but then the problem is that this data is not accessible and there's no way people will work with it without it being converted into a machine readable format. And that's where the idea came. Um, I got the idea to scrap this data and store it in, in a package so that people can easily um, use it. So the process first um, it began with scraping the data from PDFs. I used the tabula, tabulizer R package, which is uh, which provides the R bind, bindings for the tabul, it's tabul, tabula Java library, um, and. Stabilizer is such an awesome package. It contains two functions that I use mostly. Um, the first one was exact areas and the second one was exact uh, extract, extract areas and extract tables. Um, that was it. As anyone would know, once you scrap the data, <clears throat> as much as it looked pretty on the published files, um, there were just small, small things that were really a nuisance, different characters, um, too many commas, too many white spaces that could not be seen with the naked eye. Um, so I spent a lot, lot, lot of time cleaning the data and I'm thankful for the Tidyverse um, ecosystem and also some base functions that are really, really important um, or I really use very, I use very much when I'm cleaning um, data. Then um, we needed to also manipulate the data. If you can, I don't know if you I can, if I can manage to take you back to the previous slides. Um, you, again, given that Kenya is divided into counties and sub-counties, for example, from my screenshot, you can see we have Migori County. Then under Migori, we had different um, sub-counties. So it will be very difficult for people to know which is the county and which is the sub-county. So I had to do a lot of manipulation, getting to know which is the county, which is the sub-county, and, and generating additional variables to um, identify the two um, levels, um, the graphical levels. So, and I also worked on very many other things. When you look at the data in its raw form and um, the pub and the clean data on R, you'll notice one or two things, um, additional stuff. But then I was look, thinking of myself as an analyst because at the end I wanted this data to be I wanted analysts to find this data easy to use, so I had to make work um, a bit easier. Then I, I had to save the data externally as .xlsx. Um, when you're creating packages, there are very many ways of killing a rat, so this is the process that I followed. So first I had to save the data externally, and then um, I created the package which uh, would host this data eventually. Um, just a snippet of the data transformation output or the, the output of the process, as I mentioned, Nyeri is a county and under Nyeri we have different sub-counties and for that you, you wouldn't be able to know which is the county and which is the sub-county. And then well, the data was reported in such a way that the total for each county was recorded at the top. For example, in Nyeri that was 374,288 and then all the different um, sub-county data was recorded after it. So assuming that people uh, or someone will be interested in carrying out um, county level analysis data, 
you will need a variable that will be able to distinguish counties from sub counties, um, especially when you, it comes to filtering, that will be a variable that will be very important. And that was one of the, um, one of the data manipulation tasks that I carried out. Um, <clears throat> this process was not as smooth. I, I, I got into so much, um, I got bugs, I, some things I wasn't able to um, figure, figure out on my own. I am part of this community called the R4DS community, um, which is amazing. You can check them out on Twitter and they provide a very safe space for anyone to ask questions without being victimized um, in any way. So all the time when um, I, I really needed to figure out something, that's the place I could run to and ask questions. And my questions would be um, answered um, very well. And R the R4DS community was <clears throat> one of the one of the things that really made this um, uh, process very smooth. There, these, these are the useful materials that I find, um, these are the materials that I find useful for package development. I'll talk about Hadley's book. Last year I attended USAR 2019 and I attended a tutorial by Hadley, Jim, Hester and Jenny Bryan on package development. And from what they presented, I felt as though package development was not all that stressful. Although I had, I had tried to develop a package in 2017 and it wasn't smooth, but I'm very grateful for the documentation nowadays. And more, more so I'm very grateful for the use this package, which makes work really, really easy. And like everything flows. When, when you're reading the R packages book by Hadley, once you go through chapter two, you will be able to come up with a very minimal package. Um, then if you want to build from that, that's when you go through other, other, the other chapters. So use this was very friendly. <laughs> I always liken it to someone who takes you from the house, um, takes you to a very posh hotel, buys you dinner, then comes wash your house, washes your house, uh, makes it clean, then brings you back. Like it's just a smooth process. And this is just an encouragement for anyone who will want to develop a package. Um, I will I will really encourage you to try this out. Um, yeah, so this is how the help files look like in the package. So what I did, I tried to maintain the package, the table naming. So for example, if you go to volume two, table 1.1, that same data, when you come to the package will be V2 underscore T 1.1. And I tried to maintain the naming um, so that it will be easier to go back and forth from the PDFs to the, to the clean data in the package. Um, later on, I actually worked on volume one, two, three, first of all. Um, I, again, I just wanted to learn how to build a package and build something that would be useful for our country. Um, but then I wasn't sure if people will take it up. So I publicized the work before even carrying out um, or extracting volume four files. And uh, the reception was amazing. Um, I, I, I think people received it more or better than I expected. So I got encouraged to finalize on, on volume four and the data right now is ready. Um, everything has been scrapped, everything is in the package. The package is yet to be published on CRAN. Um, I'm supposed to be going through that process uh, sometime soon. Then as when I published, when I publicized the, the work, someone reached out to me telling me that they do not use R and requested if I could share um, some of the data sets in Excel SX. And then in my head, I, I thought, okay, there's no way I will be able to share um, Excel SX data or every request that comes in. Then that's when the idea, I got an idea of hosting this data somewhere and being an R enthusiast, the place I first thought of was a shiny app. Again, I wasn't really used to developing shiny apps and I just wanted to learn how to develop shiny, a shiny app and also host this um, data, which was a very uh, beautiful process. I have to admit the, um, this data, the, for this shiny app, the most important uh, tab is the data sets tab. That's where you can download um, the data sets themselves. But then there's also the ICT analysis where I try to do something small with the data. Um, and I just wanted to learn how to 
uh, create leaflet maps and and host maps on Shiny or develop Shiny apps that contain maps themselves. So when you open that tab, it's a bit slow. I've not I've I've, I've not really done much into speeding up the process, but I should be doing that um, very soon. But again, the most important tab in this is the data sets tab. And the best thing about this is um, being able to create a drop down menu that depends on another drop down menu. That was my biggest takeaway. And I learned this from the Master in Shiny book by Hadley. I think it's still being developed. I'm not sure if it's completed. For example, if you select volume four, you should only be able to um, get a list of data sets that are in volume four. Um, it's not as easy as it sounds. You have to learn a lot of things that are in that book. If you're interested, uh, you can go through the book. It's, it's available online. And then um, after that, I sat down and thought, okay, how can this data help us as a country? At, it was at that moment I was really interested at the work um, the UN is doing with the Sustainable Development Goals. And I tried to look at how um, this data could be used to see or to examine or to assess the progress that Kenya has made towards achieving the SDGs. So this is a shiny dashboard that I came up with. Um, it's not perfect, but it's something I am really proud of because again, I, my pet projects are usually a learning. Um, I use them as a learning process. Like when I want to learn something, I think of something I can build out of that. And so I really, I also learned a lot of things when developing this shiny dashboard. Um, it's it's not pretty on mobile phone, and I also it also has some issues to do with alignment. Although from my end uh, everything is aligned well, but I received feedback that um, when when people view it on their platforms, um, it there are some alignment issues which I'm yet to work on, but it's okay. Like the information, if you really need quick information, especially if you want to see how different counties are progressing, we, we've, we've been at, at a period where um, we've been on lockdown with COVID-19 things. And um, um, the Minister of Education sometime in a few months ago was talking about us having uh, virtual classes. But then one problem um, in Kenya is that the mobile phone penetration is really, really low, really, really low. And we hear about it, but until you look at the data, you will realize that even a county like Nairobi, which is a capital city, there are still people who don't have mobile phones. There are still people who don't have access to the internet. Um, and so virtual classes um, or online classes will not really happen as opposed to what I'm seeing in the West, uh, Western world. I think there was a short break and then people quickly transited to uh, virtual learning. Um, here, it wouldn't be that smooth. We will definitely leave people out, uh, which would be unfair. So this is a dashboard that can be used to just look at such, um, such things. Um, the data has also been used by the Kenya Red Cross to assess the COVID-19 high-risk areas. This is a dashboard that was created by a friend of mine in the Kenya Red Cross, and it's really pretty, and I'm grateful that they decided to use something that I had built um, as a pet project to um, look at how COVID-19 is progressing in Kenya. And that's it from my end, thank you. In case you have questions or you would want to know more information about this project, you can reach me um, through contacts that are on my website. And that's my website link um, over there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Shalmit, for your interesting presentation. And uh, mm, I would like to thank all of you for participating in the event. Uh, enjoy other sessions and have a nice day. Thank you very much.